Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. A wife decided to secretly cheat on her husband, but it didn't work out because of one incident. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy it! Hey Peter, do you have a minute? Todd said, looking into my office. Before Todd Brooks visited my office, my week had been nearly perfect. I need to run down to the Coombe building to meet with the people from Wagner and McGee, he began. Can you do me a favor? Of course, what do you need? Watch this, he waved a thin manila folder. This is what I need to talk to you about. No problem. When do you want to discuss this? Meet me at Doyle's Irish Pub on the corner from Coombe at 5. I'll give you a treat. Everything in the folder should be self-explanatory, he handed me the file and hurried out of the office. From that moment on, my lucky streak ended. It had been the best week at work in months. Up to this point, my long-term project was coming to a very successful conclusion. Moreover, it seemed that I would not have to take that extra flight to London, as I had warned my wife, Sarah. All the dots could be connected and every T crossed without having to go across the pond. I knew Sarah, my sweet wife, would be delighted with this news. My last business trips abroad came at a bad time, the last one led to a quarrel. Sarah was very offended that I would miss the gallery opening that I had promised to attend. Since Sarah was responsible for organizing major events for the Museum of Art, these gala events were a big deal for her. I was able to convince her that I had not planned the trip solely to avoid accompanying her to the event. I didn't think much of Todd's folder, putting it aside to read when everything else was finished. As my project was coming to an end, I started planning to take a few days off. Perhaps Sarah and I could spend a long weekend at that little hotel on the lake. At four o'clock, I was completely free, my desk was clear, and I decided to leave for the day. I took Todd's notebook and file and went to Doyle's pub to meet Todd. I expected to read the information and jot down some comments while I waited. Since I was in Doyle's pub, it seemed appropriate to order a Guinness. After a long sip of the tart stout, I opened the folder for the first time. What I found was a thin, tattered sheath of papers with a note from Todd stapled to the top. Peter, I found this hanging out in our department. You need to study this carefully. After reading this, you may want to skip our meeting. Do not do that. Meet me at Doyle's pub at 5 so we can talk. I'll try to come early. Todd. This, of course, only increased my curiosity to the limit. Looking back, I wished I had thrown the entire folder in the trash. I would feel better, my life could have turned out differently, and I could have avoided a lot of pain. What Todd asked me to read was a story, a love story with explicit intimate content. At first glance, there was nothing unusual about this. It was called My Romance by Sam 33. So what was the matter? Why was Todd so keen for me to read his favorite erotic novel? It's not a big deal, you know, but I've never made it a habit to read something like this. My night life with Sarah was interesting enough without fantasizing about someone else. I couldn't imagine why Todd thought it was important that I read this. It didn't take long to understand why. Right on the first page were all the clues we needed, the names Todd and Sarah, and a mention of a gala event at the museum. Obviously, Sam 33 was my sweet wife of 33 years, Sarah Ann Miller. What a surprise! Never in my wildest dreams did I think that Sarah would write, much less read, erotic literature. This was a story I was dying to read. Perhaps Sarah and I could talk about it or relive her fantasy later. I didn't have to read far before I started to have misgivings about the story. My name was not mentioned anywhere in the document, but because it was written in the first person, I could hear myself being discussed when the narrator, my wife, mentioned my husband or talked about night in our daily life at home. The gist of the story was a romance between Sarah and a mysterious man referred to only as my lover. The story apparently took place at the museum's most recent gala event, the one I was suddenly absent from. What surprised me was that the date had been planned for a long time. There was no doubt about the author of the story or its authenticity, a perfect description of the midnight blue dress Sarah wore that night, along with the events that took place in our living room when it was just her and me. I quickly read the story, skipping most of the scenes after the gala when her lover took her to his hotel room and they had an intimate all night. I wasn't interested in knowing the details. 
Just the thought of it made me nauseous. T.S. Eliot wrote, April is the cruelest month. For me, of course, March turned out to be demonic. At least, that's how it started. Sarah, my Sarah, cheated on me. She was the last woman I would ever expect to cheat on me. Sarah was so reserved, demonstrating a very conservative set of values. The reality of what I read caused me pain worse than any pain I have ever experienced. I fell in love with Sarah in third grade. I often caught her looking in my direction too. She was my version of the little girl with the red hair, Charlie Brown. In Sarah's case, it would be Peter Miller's sandy-haired little girl. Neither of us ever approached the other to express personal feelings because we were both extremely shy in matters of the heart. It wasn't until the homecoming game our freshman year of high school that I gained the courage to approach her. I invited her to the game and to the dance after our victory. I felt so awkward that I was sure she would never want to date me again. I was amazed a few days later when she came up to me in the dining room and told me how great it had been. I could tell by the smile on her face that she was more than just polite. We dated throughout high school. I was sure we would break up when college started, but she insisted on choosing the same university as me. By our second year, we were engaged. The wedding took place in the middle of the summer after graduation. Sarah was lucky enough to get a job right away at the museum while I was working on my MBA. I signed a contract with the international company Parker Price shortly before receiving my diploma. It's not that Sarah and I haven't had major disagreements, we had some very difficult years when she helped me study. Apart from our early difficulties, everything else between us was like a dream. Oh yeah, we had the occasional argument, like the time I told her I couldn't go to the gala, but this is normal in marriage. There was no problem between us that we could not openly discuss and quickly resolve. So why did she cheat on me? Sarah and I were always happy with our intimate life, or so I thought. Our intimate life wasn't wild, but what it lacked in passion it more than made up for an intimacy. Sarah had absolutely no interest in being creative, it didn't matter how creative we became. Now here I sit with a very thinly veiled description of a wild night of night in some hotel while I was in London, I said, feeling waves of nausea wash over me. Todd brought me out of my dark thoughts. Sorry, buddy, but I knew you'd want to see this story. What a mess this is. I said mechanically, swirling the last drops of my first Guinness. I'm working like hell to close things out with Evan McAdams at ITI Financial Services, and here she is behind my back, playing the part of the available girl. I didn't want to be the one to bring you this news, but someone should have told you, mate. I found this copy that was being shared in my department. Almost all the guys have read it and know who wrote it. One of them even asked me if I had ever slept with your wife, Todd said angrily. I stared at Todd, this thought had never even crossed my mind. I wanted to hit him for being so stupid, Todd continued. I pushed the document aside, and we both looked at it as if we expected it to attack us. Todd, when you left our house that day, you were supposed to go stay with your mother-in-law in Maryland for a week. Was that true? Yes, and I can prove it. Call Anna or her parents, they will confirm my words, he waved to the waiter and ordered another Guinness for both of us. I looked away. Sorry, Todd, that was a stupid question. Peter, I would never do such a mean thing to you, but if I were you, I would ask the same question. What a mess this is, Todd replied. I took a deep breath, wiped a tear from my eye, and swallowed the rest of my anger along with the last drops of my first Guinness. Sarah wants to stop taking pills and start a family, I chuckled at the irony. As if that's possible now. But what should I do now? Good question, Todd responded. Do you think you can ever forgive her? I waited until our drinks arrived so I could take another sip before answering. You know, until this moment, I had never faced this issue as a real possibility. It was something that happens to other guys. Sarah and I were above it. I took another sip and looked into the murky depths of my glass. I remember a few years ago when Sarah's neighbor divorced her husband after only three years of marriage. She found out that he had cheated on her. Sarah and I discussed it a lot and agreed that Beth made the right choice. Ted was an immature jerk who didn't understand how lucky he was. Sarah herself told Beth that any cheater should be thrown out. I took another sip and thought about it. It was so simple and clear just three years ago. 
He made a vow to be faithful till death do part. Then he broke that promise with some girl from work. Beth found out and left him. It was so simple and obvious. But that was Ted, and this is Sarah. And it hurts like hell. I love her with all my heart. At the same time, I hate her to the core and want her to burn in hell. So what do you want to do? Here's that question again. I finished my drink and waved off Todd's offer of a third. I guess I need to dig a little deeper. If this was a one-time affair, maybe with some counseling and patience, we can get over it. If this is part of a longer affair, we're done. Todd sighed long and painfully. Well, old man, I'm afraid I can't help you. I checked the website where the story was posted, and there are two more written by Sam33. Both of them were written and posted before this. All three are about the same. You are not mentioned by name, Sarah is mentioned, luckily, that's the only one I appear in. He handed me an image of a computer screen showing Sarah's page on a story site. It's a free site, so go ahead and draw your own conclusions. I accepted the paper and held back my tears. There was a lump in my throat so all I could do was offer Todd a weak smile. Talk to Sarah, dude. Don't go down without a fight. But will she be honest with me? You won't know until you try. Don't give up until hope runs out. You both deserve it. I knew in my heart that Todd was right. What Sarah and I built should not be let go without a fight. We ended up having one hell of a fight, then I let it go. After I left Todd, I headed back to the office to think. The place was empty, but it was perfect for me. I called home and left a message for Sarah that I would be working late. Thank God for voicemail, God alone knew who she was really with. I wasted no time loading the website on my computer to check out Sarah's other stories. While they were being printed, I was thinking about the first of them. The day described in Sarah's story was still clear in my mind. It was Friday, and I left work early to catch an evening flight to Heathrow. I was to spend Saturday night and Sunday afternoon with Evan McAdams, discussing the nature of our agreement. Sarah needed to be at the museum to review the gala preparations and check on the catering. She was working with a new team, and she had trouble trusting them, yet she expected me to accompany her. We'd been planning this for months, now she had to go alone. Sarah looked amazing that evening. The dress was the one she said she chose for a special evening between us, but now I wondered. Sarah was not an incredibly beautiful woman, she tended to be slightly overweight for her height, her hair was short and light brown, but no one looked more gorgeous to me. I loved her with my heart and soul. We argued about my trip, Sarah seemed more hurt than angry. I convinced her that I didn't want to go to London, I even showed her the cancellation receipt for a room at the Hyatt Regency next to the museum that I had booked for the night without me. Sarah could have used the museum's guest room. We hugged and kissed, swearing our love for each other. Just as we were about to walk out to our cars, Todd arrived. He was carrying a fax that had just arrived under his arm. He had a stack of folders with additional information that ITI wanted to discuss. As it turned out, this was the information that sealed the deal with ITI. As soon as Todd handed me the documents, Sarah came down dressed to perfection in her stunning blue dress. Wow, Peter, you should reconsider this trip, buddy. If Anna looked like Sarah, I'd never let her out of my sight, Todd joked a little. Sarah blushed, we laughed and went our separate ways. I waved to Anna, who was sitting in the car waiting for Todd. The same scene appeared in Sarah's story at the beginning of the third paragraph. Peter came into the house, but I didn't seem to be present, Sarah wrote. Todd stopped by to leave me some information. When he saw Sarah, he said, Wow, Peter must be crazy if Anna looked like you. I wouldn't let you leave the house tonight. This time, it was Sarah who waved to Anna as Todd returned to his car. It was all there, but there was more. She met her unknown lover at a reception, this was prearranged. They didn't spend much time together at the gala because Sarah was busy with backstage details. After the party ended, he took her to his hotel room and they spent the night having a night. Although I avoided the details, I could see hints of things Sarah and I had never done. However, this story already had enough surprises to last a lifetime. Sarah didn't leave until late the next morning. The only mention of me was when Sarah said to her lover, I never get that kind of treatment at home. This comment was like a blow to the heart. 
I never thought that my love for Sarah could fade so quickly. There were two more stories on the website, they were about the same. It seemed like she was with the same lover, but without names, it was hard to tell. It was difficult to pinpoint an exact date for these two stories, but both took place in a hotel in the city. One was a midday meeting, something Sarah and I had never done. The other was another night, Sarah seemed to enjoy taking full advantage of my trips to London. At some point in the second story, her lover made a comment related to her normal intim life, a humorous reference to how bad she usually felt. Sarah confessed her love for me, however, she spent the evening having an intimate with her lover. I sat for a long time with my notepad in front of me, jotting down thoughts and trying to answer Todd's question, what do I want to do? I knew I should talk to her, but attacking her suddenly seemed like a bad idea. So, Sarah, I think you cheated on me, yes? I braced for the two possible outcomes, and neither of them was good. 1. She is guilty. Sarah could never keep secrets from me, I could always see it on her face, even Christmas surprises were transparent in Sarah's smiles. Another possibility is that she is innocent but furious at my accusation. How long do I want to sleep on the couch? Even innocence will lead to trauma and counseling, not the most pleasant prospect. As I wrote and doodled, a plan began to form. I'll try to recreate the conversation we had when Beth and Ted got divorced. There was a married guy in another department who considered himself a big conqueror. He was very cautious in public, but in the office, he was known as the one who regularly harassed all the secretaries. Amy, my personal assistant, complained about how he harassed her. I knew I could get all the information I needed from Sarah if I framed the conversation correctly. All I had to do was remain calm and observant. As a backup plan, I arranged to go to London for a week. Although it wasn't necessary, I was willing to take this step if it meant I had to leave home for a week. It was already past 8 in the evening when I turned off the computer, packed my things, and went home. I knew I would set a new record for getting home late from work, but I didn't care. At least I could face Sarah calmly. Darling, you came back quite late, Sarah said happily. She was curled up on the sofa reading a novel. I thought you were almost done with this ITI thing. The problem arose towards the end of the day, I replied, giving enough truth to avoid lying. I needed to think about it. Have you eaten? I can heat up something if you want. Or thanks, but no thanks, I interrupted. I'll just make myself a sandwich. Sarah came and sat at the kitchen table while I cooked. By the way, I might have to fly to London after all, I said with irritation. I'll fly away on Saturday or Sunday, but that's not certain yet. I'll be able to tell you more tomorrow. I grabbed a beer to go with my sandwich and sat down across from my wife. Do you remember Dean from accounting? I asked, starting the decisive conversation. Sarah reacted with a dissatisfied sigh, confirming that she remembered him well. So it looks like he's in big trouble at home. His wife caught him, great. I've never met a person as disgusting as this guy, I continued. Rumor has it that his wife discovered that he had finally started an affair with one of the women in the office and kicked him out. It's right for him. So far, everything was going according to plan. Sarah's face showed genuine disgust for Dean. I needed to push further. I can't believe anyone in your office was stupid enough to fall for his advances. Who is she? I don't want to say but at least she was not married. I finished my sandwich and took a long swig from the bottle. The good news is that she left him too, I said with a laugh. This was a preparatory remark. Apparently, he wrote a story about it and posted it on several adult sites on the internet. He wasn't even smart enough to change the names or details. Sarah fell silent. Can you believe it? Of course, I would never cheat on you in the first place, but brag about it. The light in Sarah's eyes went out. She pulled away from me, this was not a good sign. I know what you mean, she responded stiffly. I put my dishes away and excused myself, saying I was going to take a shower. When I returned, Sarah was again sitting in her corner of the sofa reading. I took my book and sat on the other end of the sofa. I pretended to read, turning the pages at the right moments, looking at the words in front of me but the only thing I was thinking about was the conversation at the kitchen table. Sarah was guilty, and I knew it, her eyes told the whole story. 
the only question was what I wanted to do with it. The next morning at work, I confirmed my trip to London. I planned to fly out on Sunday morning, this would give me a chance to rest and begin to get used to the jet lag. A nice side effect was that I got to be nice to Sarah on Friday night and all day on Saturday. I debated whether to confront Sarah but decided not to take the nuclear option until I was fully prepared to bear the consequences. A week away would give me time to think and prepare. My last days at home before the trip went better than I could have expected. Sarah was busy in her office, making plans for her next gallery opening, and I had no reason to disturb her. On Friday night, we cuddled before bed, all I could think about was her decision to cheat on me. Why did she do this, knowing that she was taking a risk? Saturday went the same way, Sarah felt unwell, and as a result, was not interested in intimacy. I pretended to be upset, but in my heart, I was happy. On Sunday, I was at the airport early and headed to Heathrow. As soon as I boarded the plane, I knew I had to hire a detective to follow Sarah. I was flying out of town, and it was the perfect time for her to make an appointment. Well, I haven't been thinking too rationally the last few days. My usual calm persona was replaced with a hothead. Evan McAdams was thrilled to meet me for breakfast on Monday. It's a pleasant surprise to see you again, Peter, he said when he greeted me. We could have signed this agreement without your special visit. We put a lot of effort into this, Evan. I just didn't want to risk something going wrong at the last minute. The board will be impressed by your dedication, some of them would like to meet you too. We had a pleasant conversation over breakfast, talking about the upcoming World Cup game between the United States and Great Britain. Naturally, Evan dismissed our chances of winning. Although I knew little about what Evan called football, I still persisted in our chances just to tease my new friend. On the way to the ITI Financial Services building, Evan said, have dinner with me tonight. I have a proposal I'd like you to think about. What proposal are we talking about? I asked. Evan smiled slightly. Tonight at dinner, then we'll talk. Now, let's get ready to meet with the ITI legal team and convince them of our agreement. Evan and I spent the day carefully working out every detail of the plan that we would present to the legal team for collaboration between ITI and Parker Price. Neither of us wanted the slightest detail to be missed. This represented too much work and a large amount of money for both corporations. I carefully prepared the PowerPoint presentation, refining it to my complete satisfaction. At 6 o'clock, I returned to the hotel to get ready for dinner. Evan met me at 7 o'clock. He took me to a cozy pub in a quiet area with excellent food and quality ale. I let Evan take the lead, waiting for him to bring up the topic of the new proposal. Peter, I'm surprised you didn't press me for information, he said as we sat back after finishing our meal. I know you'll tell me what's on your mind. I'm just focused on finishing what I started, there will be time to discuss new projects later. Ah, but this is not a new project, at least not in the usual sense of the word. It will be something completely different. Evan paused while our table was cleared of dishes. My deputy had just left for a bigger and better position with a German firm. Since the only logical step for him at ITI would have been to take my place, I had to wish him luck. This left a critical vacancy at just the time when ITI and Parker Price are starting a new joint venture, and I want you to take over. I was stunned. I don't know what they think at home, but I'd like to hear more. Would your board agree to this? Evan nodded. The chief has already spoken to Daniel Price. Parker Price would be willing to place you with us indefinitely. We will take over all your payments to Parker Price and offer you and your wife a generous housing allowance. I don't know how much you earn at home, but between you and me, I suspect that if you approach things right, you can join ITI with a generous salary increase. I told Evan I would think about it and let him know before the board meeting. The truth was that it was a gift from heaven. Although I didn't want to seem too excited, the only problem was that I had no idea where my life was going at the moment, much less when I would figure it out. The next morning, I met Evan again for breakfast. I explained the dilemma I was in. How much time do I have to give you a final answer? This is a great offer, and I'm really interested in it. If things don't go well with Sarah, this will be a real lifesaver, but I need a little time. Can you give me an answer by the end of the month? That will give you a little over three weeks. Great. This way, I can complete all the business at Parker Price. I don't want to leave anything unfinished, 
I owe them that at least. I spent the flight back home lost in thought. Somehow, I needed to get to the bottom of Sarah's secret life. Pursuing her wouldn't work because the only evidence I had came from my trips abroad. Another option was to hire a professional to find the answers. I abandoned the idea because I didn't want to spend money proving something I essentially already knew. Besides, I had no intention of leaving on a business trip for the next three weeks. If I wanted to hire someone, I should have done it before leaving for London. In the end, I decided to act directly. I have a couple of weeks, I'll try to gather more information, like reading different stories. Perhaps if I study the stories again and make a list of possible lovers, I can learn something new. As usual, Sarah seemed happy to have me home again. Since secrets seemed to have become a way of life in her house, I did not mention anything about the job offer at ITI. I spoke only of the great success of the proposal, and like a supportive wife, Sarah was delighted for me. When asked about her life in my absence, Sarah said that, in addition to going to work as usual, she stayed home and worked on a few projects around the house. I didn't notice any major changes at home, however, whatever the projects were, I didn't see any traces. Sarah and I made love that night and went back to our regular schedule. I reasoned that if she had already cheated on me, it wouldn't hurt to keep up appearances. I never thought there was anything wrong with our love life. I wasn't suggesting trying anything new that was so vividly described in Sarah's stories. The thought of trying something she had already experienced with someone else made me feel sick. True to form, exactly a week after I returned home, a story appeared on Sarah's website. It was similar to the others containing detailed descriptions of intimate encounters between Sarah and her lover while I was in London. I was just a footnote mentioned only indirectly towards the end of the story. Sarah wrote how she wished she could enjoy intimate like this every night. When I walked into the office the next morning, it seemed like every man in the office was exchanging knowing smirks with me. Poor fool, his wife is cheating on him and he doesn't even know. For some reason, those looks were even worse than the thought of what Sarah was doing. I thought about calling Todd and inviting him to Doyle's pub, but the thought of discussing my humiliation in public was too painful. Instead, I decided it was time to confront Sarah once and for all. I left work early, hoping to get home before Sarah. In retrospect, it might have been better to confront Sarah immediately upon my return. Instead of being furious, I would be hurt and angry. Perhaps we could discuss the situation calmly. Sarah arrived home at the usual time. She came in, put her briefcase on the table, kicked off her heels, and went to the refrigerator to get her favorite bottled water. Then she came into the living room where I was sitting with a bottle of Samuel Adams. Honey, I'm so glad you're home tonight, she sighed. I'm tired today. You wouldn't believe the work Dr. Richards gave me, and to think it's only Thursday. I opened the folder I was holding, pulled out a stapled package of papers, and threw it on the coffee table in the middle of the room. I made sure it was laying in front of Sarah where she could see it clearly. Sarah, did you write this? I asked, pointing to the tattered copy of the story Todd shared with me. Sarah's face turned almost scarlet. I knew right away that I wasn't going to like the rest of the conversation. Yes, I wrote it, Peter, she said hesitantly. So that means you wrote these two? I shook out the other three stories, including her latest publication. Yes. I wrote them, she admitted, but I felt the heat growing inside me. Damn it, Sarah. How long have you been cheating on me? Don't you remember our conversations about Beth and Ted? You should have known how I would react when I found out. Sarah tried to answer, but I waved my hand. Sarah's face froze with frustration. Todd found the first, or rather, the third story about you having an intim with your lover behind my back. He said it was going around the office. You know what it's like to find out that every guy in the company knows that I have been made a fool. Sarah's eyes lit up, and she bit her lip, looking away from me. Why did you do that, Sarah? Do you hate me that much? At this moment, she said in an unusually calm voice, Yes, I hate you that much, and even more. This answer didn't fit into my plan. I didn't have a ready answer for this. What right do you have to sit here and accuse me of treason? She barked. Now I'm exploding like fireworks on Independence Day. I let my anger control me instead of controlling it as I should have. What right? I screamed. 
I'm your husband, and right on this coffee table is the original account of the four times you had a night with your lover behind my back. God only knows how many times there were that didn't even make it to print. Sarah grabbed the stories and threw them at me. To hell with you, she exclaimed. I don't need to sit here and listen to this crap from you, especially after the crap I went through today. She stood up and stormily left the room. Sarah, come back. We need to talk about this. I need to know. At this point, I realized that she already knew everything she needed to know. You're not in the mood to hear anymore. She shot back. Sarah, go to hell, you an idiot. Sarah paused in the bedroom only to grab a few things and then headed for the door. Sarah, come back and talk to me. She silently walked towards the garage door. Where are you going, Sarah? What, to see your lover? Yes, that's right. When she opened the garage door, she turned to me and said, I definitely don't want to stay with you tonight. A moment later, I heard her car start and leave the garage. Okay, it's all over now. If Sarah were innocent of all charges, she would usually stay and calmly discuss the situation. Leaving as she did only confirmed my suspicions about her guilt. Sarah had barely walked out the door when I called Evan at home. I told him that things were moving faster than I expected and that I would take the position as soon as possible. I asked him if I could get the job directly, cutting ties with Parker Price completely. He was confident that this could be worked out. I asked him if someone could help me look for apartments that I could look at after I arrived. I have no idea how to look for an apartment in London, I said. I'll do better. I'll find someone to go with you and help you choose one. I hardly slept that night. The next morning, I resigned from Parker Price since I was moving to ITI. Daniel thought the best solution was to end the relationship immediately. The only thing I asked him to do was to keep the location of my new job confidential. I shared with him the sad state of my personal life. My second priority for the day was to meet with my lawyer. I chose Sandra How because she had a good reputation. Thanks to a cancellation, she was able to see me that same day. She promised to drop a simple divorce by mutual consent with the division of property in half. There was very little equity in the house, so I told her to either sell it or give it to Sarah. Finally, I signed a power of attorney so that my lawyer could proceed with the divorce without my presence. My last visit was to the bank. I closed all joint credit cards and took half the money out of the accounts. On the way home to get ready, I stopped at the cell phone company and canceled my account. I'll get a new one when I get to London on Saturday. I packed my bags and a few other items and booked a room at the hotel closest to the airport. By Sunday morning, I was on the plane to Heathrow, never expecting to look back. And just like that, my life completely changed. It would never be the same again. What Sarah did after I left, I had no idea. She had no way to contact me. I didn't give her an address other than my lawyer's office. She didn't have my phone number. The secretary at work was told to simply tell her that I no longer worked for Parker Price. She and her lover could live happily ever after without bothering me. I left the game and had little interest in playing on the field. All my attention was focused on my career. Evan had booked me into the Crown Plaza Heathrow until I decided where I wanted to live permanently. By the time I got to London, it was late local time and I was exhausted. I fell onto the bed and slept soundly for the first time in weeks. The time difference made itself felt the next morning when I was awakened by a knock on the door. The clock by my bed said 10 a.m., but my body clock was against waking up at 4 a.m. I quickly pulled on my tracksuit and looked through the crack in the door. A cute little redhead stood in front of me, smiling and holding two coffees. Just a minute, I muttered unlocking the bolt. Sorry if I came too early, but I did bring coffee. My name is Fiona Kelly, her voice had a cute accent. You and McAdams asked me to help you rent an apartment. If I came too early, I can wait in the lobby. In my mind, Fiona Kelly was the perfect image of a leprechaun, her voice betrayed her Celtic heritage. She was almost a head shorter than me, no more than 5 feet 3 inches or 4 inch at best. She seemed even shorter because she was wearing flat shoes rather than heels. Her makeup was barely visible and her hair was cut short for ease of care. Instead of being curvy, Fiona had a strong, evenly slim, and toned athlete's body. 
I figured that if I were interested in the gym or running, Fiona would be a good person to advise me. I wouldn't call Fiona beauty, she was also not a gray mouse. She was more than pleasant to look at. If she had tried harder, I had no doubt that she could have been quite attractive. But Fiona seemed uninterested in external details. Nothing about her appearance looked poor or sloppy, everything was carefully selected from the best stores but with special attention to style. She clearly felt comfortable being herself. I need to shower and shave, I said, swallowing a yawn. If you don't mind, you can wait here, no problem. Great. I'll be ready in a few minutes. Sit here and enjoy your coffee. Oh no, both coffees are for you. I prefer tea myself, but I was told that without coffee, you Yankees are not able to face the light of day or something like that, I replied, laughing at her wit. I spent the whole day with Fiona. She showed me four apartments for evaluation. I was truly shocked at the price I would have to pay for a simple two-room apartment. The first option was clearly not within my means. It was beautiful and partially furnished, however, the cost was prohibitive, and it seemed a little too posh for my tastes as a single man. I needed something simple, one bedroom and another room that I could use as an office. I politely declined and asked Fiona to show me the second option. This option was more my style, not too luxurious and somewhat smaller. The cost was only slightly more affordable than the first option, however, it was too far from the ITI Financial Services building. I told Fiona I wanted to see a third option. There was a lot that was attractive about this apartment. It was very compact. I honestly couldn't understand how one of the bedrooms could be used for anything other than an office. The kitchen was new and well lit. I could imagine myself in this place. It was also quite close to the ITI building, however, the cost put me off. I told Fiona that we should stop and eat. I wasn't sure if my body wanted breakfast, lunch, or a midday snack, but I was ready to eat. Fiona took me to a pub not far from the apartment we had just visited. The food was great, and I found that I could drink a pretty decent cold fosters, so life with warm beer did not await me. Lunch with Fiona was a real pleasure. She had a sharp, lively sense of humor that made me want to get to know her better, but it was the mischievous twinkle in her eyes and frothy smile that drew me in. I was in her company for no more than five minutes before I felt absolutely calm. The quiet conversation over dinner made us feel like we'd known each other for a lifetime instead of just half a day. We talked about everything from American politics to music to the latest film premieres. Everything in the conversation worked out perfectly, we were even able to talk calmly and without conflict about Sarah and my upcoming divorce. Where our lunch break dragged on for almost an hour and a half without me even noticing it, I realized that I at least had one friend in the UK. It was good, for the first time in weeks, I didn't think about the nightmare that my life had become and began to move forward. Peter, Fiona began as the conversation began to fade, mind if I ask what you didn't like about the first three apartments? This will help me find something that will be more to your taste. I liked all three, Fiona, especially the last one. It's just, well, to be honest, I'm afraid of the cost. Did you talk to Ian about the salary? Certainly. Then you should know that you can afford any of these apartments without any problems. When I hesitated to answer, Fiona continued, My apartment is quite comparable to the ones we saw, and I'm just an accountant. As an assistant director, you can easily afford something much more elegant than these. I have simple tastes, Fiona, and simple needs. Elegance has never been something I aspire to. As I finished my last sip of coffee, I glanced at the simple yet graceful woman across from me. Why don't you decide which apartment is best for me? A smile lit up Fiona's face. Great! Then let's go back and sign the lease for the third option. Fiona turned out to be a tough negotiator, the final rental price turned out to be quite acceptable for me. However, not everything that happened in the conversation between Fiona and my new landlord was obvious to me, all I cared about was the result. When we finished, we headed back to the pub for a quick beer. When we arrived, Fiona said, Well, welcome to the area, Peter. Do you live nearby? Fiona nodded. I've lived here for several years. So. Why did you choose this apartment for me? Oh, I knew as soon as you walked in that it would be perfect for you. You want something cozy, not fancy. She gave me a flirtatious smile. 
That, and the fact that I live in an apartment right across the street. I couldn't help but laugh. Okay, maybe we can ride to work together. Are you sure it's appropriate for a deputy director to carpool with a simple accountant? Think of the scandal. I don't know how things are in London, but where I come from, it's always normal to see the deputy director with a friend. I admit that I was strongly attracted to Fiona. She quickly became my best friend, but that was all I could allow myself to consider her to be. Having been burned once, I became more careful, plus I was technically still a married man. I had not heard from my lawyer since arriving in London and had no idea what the situation was. When I had not heard from my lawyer by the end of the second week, I called him. She was given the documents on the day you left for London, he told me. I could tell she was caught off guard. I haven't seen anyone this upset about this in a long time. Is she going to fight the conditions? I thought I was pretty generous considering. I don't know yet, her lawyer is delaying. We have a court hearing next week, then we'll find out more. Somehow, this didn't surprise me. With a boyfriend already chosen, Sarah had no reason to rush. My guess was that she was trying to get to me again. Well, I wasn't going to take that bait. If she wants to stall, let her stall. She'll run out of money much sooner than I will. I could concentrate on my work, and with Fiona by my side, life seemed pretty good. Fiona was invaluable in the first few months as I settled into a job, a new city, and a new country. She never tired of making fun of my American pronunciation and ways of doing things. Of course, I made fun of her back. At first, Fiona only met me for a casual lunch at the pub near the office. It didn't take long before we expanded our horizons to dinner and theater or a concert. We discovered that we both had a deep love for the same types of music. We became regular visitors to the Royal Festival Hall. However, our dates were entirely platonic, although it was clear to both of us that the attraction was growing. Where are we going, Peter? Do we have a chance at a real relationship? Asked Fiona as we stopped for a drink after a particularly moving performance of Four's Requiem. I'm still married, Finn. I know I've been in London for three months, but the pain of what Sarah did to me is still quite fresh. You're really helping me deal with it. If you're still interested, ask me again when Sarah sets me free. She smiled warmly and laid her head on my shoulder. Count on it, she whispered. After a long silence, she added, Finn, I like the sound of that. By the way, no one has ever called me that before. I gave her probably the most intimate kiss we had shared so far. However, in the grand scheme of things, it was very reserved. Actually, I admitted when the hug ended, it was an accident. That makes it even more special because it's from you. I hugged her, and we clung to each other, drinking another glass of wine. Then Fiona carefully pulled away, turned, and kissed me tenderly. I think I love you, Peter. I'm willing to wait, but I want you to know that I really think we could have something very special. We quickly returned to my apartment. We maintained a chaste relationship for months, walking around the more intimate one, but neither of us dared to take the first step. Now we moved forward with no intention of looking back. On this special evening, the feelings we shared flared up with renewed vigor. Fiona took my hand, led me through my apartment, and didn't stop until she came to my bedroom. We stood opposite each other for a moment, enjoying the magical vision of love in its purest moment. Finn, I need you to know that I'm still married. My lawyer should have pushed Sarah to sign the papers, but for some reason, she's still dragging her feet. Fiona tried to drown me out with a kiss, but after I enjoyed her lips, I continued talking. Sarah can drag it out all she wants, Finn, but it won't change anything between us. I stopped loving her when she admitted to cheating. I ran my fingers through her silky red hair and cut the back of her head. Fiona, I fall in love with you every day we spend together. I hope you never doubt it. Instantly, all rational thought was lost. What followed was a long, slow dance of love that lasted until the early hours of the morning. Fiona fell asleep cuddled up to me, and although I tried to stay awake to enjoy the pleasure of watching her, I fell into a quiet and contented sleep. The next morning, we continued to explore our newfound passion for love. By Sunday evening, the reality of our situation began to dawn on me. Finn, I'm not sure having an affair in the office is a good idea. I'm not sure if ITI has any legal objections 
but it might be awkward for both of us. I was thinking the same thing, Peter. I'll talk to my uncle tomorrow and see what he can do for me. I'm already ready for new challenges. Your uncle? I asked, confused. Uncle Yuan? When my face clearly showed confusion, she explained, Yuan McAdams is my mother's brother. I looked at her in bewilderment. And when were you going to tell me this little news, young lady? Fiona shrugged casually. Oh, probably sometime before the wedding. Wedding, huh? I hugged her. I like the sound of that. Unfortunately, Sarah may object. Fiona kissed me tenderly. I can wait. Over the next few weeks, I stayed in constant contact with my lawyer. She just doesn't want to sign, Peter, Sandra Howe, my lawyer, told me one Friday night when I called her. Damn it, between you and me, she doesn't even want to negotiate in good faith. The disappointment we both felt dripped from her voice. I think she's determined to drive you both into misery. Just when I think we've hit rock bottom in legal maneuvering, her lawyer comes up with a new plea, and everything goes downhill. What is she trying to achieve? Tell her I'll pay. I know she wants to meet you in person. That won't happen, lawyer. I'm not going to listen to the lies she and her lover made up. Tell her it's over. I'll try again, but I'm afraid it won't lead to anything. Can't you just talk to her on the phone? Maybe that will satisfy her. After all, there's a long distance between you two. After I put the phone down, cursing Sarah, now I had to find a way to break the news to Fiona. It turned out to be easier than I thought. About an hour after I got home that night, I was in the kitchen trying to make dinner when suddenly a familiar noise was heard in the hallway. When I went to check, Fiona was directing traffic as a cavalcade of volunteers carried her belongings into my apartment. What impudence, I joked, hugging Fiona. Shouldn't I have proposed to you first before you moved in? Fiona tried to free herself, but I hugged her tighter. Wait, guys. Fiona did not have time to finish her command when I kissed her on the lips, long, warmly, and very pleasantly. She literally melted in my arms. When she was completely relaxed, I broke the hug for a moment only to whisper, Finn, why don't you move in with me? It will save a lot of time traveling back and forth. Before she could answer, I pressed my lips to hers. Wow, Peter, what a brilliant idea. Where did you come up with that? Around this time, I smelled something burning in the kitchen. Oh, shit! I exclaimed, rushing to save dinner from complete destruction. When the noise in the other room died down, Fiona crept into the kitchen, put her arm around my waist, and examined the burnt pan. Is it my fault? Don't worry, sweet Finn. The meat is fine, it was just a ginger glaze. I'll have a replacement ready before you're ready for dinner. I hugged Fiona. I'm going to adore this new arrangement, I said before resuming our interrupted hug. Have you spoken to your lawyer? I cringed at her question, hoping this could be put off until after dinner. Yes. It won't like this, right? Sandra is causing trouble. Looks like this will take longer than I wanted. Fiona looked disappointed. I hugged her and kissed her tenderly. It doesn't change anything, Finn. I'm going to marry you. You and I will live happily ever after. We just have to wait until Sarah gives in. She can't hold on forever. Actually, I took her hand and led her to the bedroom. Peter, I can wait until after dinner, she replied, laughing. I can't, I objected. I led her to my dresser and pulled out from the back of my underwear drawer a small box that I had hidden there just a week ago. Opening the box, I said, Fiona Kelly, will you marry me? Fiona looked in surprise at the diamond ring that stared back at her. It was the biggest ring I could afford, and to me, at least, it looked impressive, definitely bigger than the one I bought for Sarah. Fiona started in bewilderment for a moment. When she reached out for the ring, her touch was careful. She looked as if she believed the ring would disappear. I began to worry when she silently ran her finger over the stone. Oh, Peter, she whispered. I. I didn't expect us to get to this point before your divorce was finalized. She hugged me and covered me with kisses. Her joyful tears moistened my face as well as hers. Of course I will marry you. 
Needless to say, we rushed through dinner and spent the rest of the night in bed celebrating our new beginning. Our connection was turbulent with a passionate essence that I hoped we would never lose. Long before we were ready to sleep, we were both completely satisfied. However, neither of us wanted to leave the bed. We lay together long after midnight, whispering to each other about our love. I was lying on my back, Finn was lying with her leg thrown over mine and her head on my shoulder. Eventually, we were able to sleep, although how we slept is a matter of conjecture. The next morning, we woke up in the same position. I woke up first, Finn's red hair tickled my face. Her scent was hypnotic. Slowly, I lowered my hand until I cued her fifth place. I'm purring, she purred. And to think I could wake up like this every morning. I'd really enjoy it. I know what you mean. I've never been so happy to see the sunrise. What do you say if we stay here all day? We need to go out and eat, Finn teased. Oh, I don't know, I countered, accepting her challenge. I think I can survive. I then got under Finn's hair and playfully bit her neck. A moment later, the jokes were forgotten, and we got down to business again. Seriously, we didn't spend the entire day in bed, but we did spend it staying very close to each other. Between our lovemaking, we sat huddled together on the sofa. I'm not sure if we were kissing or, as Finn called it, making out. I suspect it depended on who you asked. Either way, we delighted in it and enjoyed it with phenomenal enthusiasm. This was the beginning of the happiest period of my life, and even the news that Fiona told me a month later did not bother me. Instead of fear and panic, it only led to more excitement. Peter, Finn began, her voice trembling with emotion. I have news, and I'm afraid it might not be good. I hugged her and gently reassured her, as long as you're with me, it can't be bad. Finn grimaced, then taking a deep breath, she said, Peter, I'm pregnant. I pulled her away to look her in the eyes. Are you serious? I'm sorry, she whispered. I didn't let her finish. I picked her up and gave her a long passionate kiss. Oh my god, Finn, this is wonderful. I love you so much. When she realized that I was not angry and was not going to leave her, she wrapped her arms and legs around me as we sighed. I took Finn out to celebrate. The celebration, of course, ended with a long night of amorous gymnastic exercises. I care even more about Finn now. If Fiona ever doubted my love for her, I gave her every reason to put that doubt aside. An accidental pregnancy seemed like a gift from God. She definitely wasn't in her plans, but I welcomed Fiona's growing belly with open arms. I began to very loudly express my anticipation for late autumn when the baby was due. I thrived at work like never before, Yuan noticed the difference immediately. Perhaps it was the added responsibility of providing for another human being, but whatever it was, Yuan McAdams was delighted with the work I was doing. The only thing that dampened my enthusiasm was the delay in finalizing the divorce. I wanted so badly to marry Finn before the baby was born, but Sarah seemed to be just as stubborn and adamant as ever. Everything suddenly changed one day in early September. It started with the surprise arrival of Todd Brooks. The stated reason for his visit was to consult on the status of the collaboration between Parker Price International and ITI, but it quickly became clear that Todd had a hidden agenda. Talk to her, Peter. It's more complicated than it seems, Todd pleaded. Almost immediately after I dropped him off at the hotel, I agreed to talk about it later, and Todd only agreed when I made a solemn promise to sit down and talk about Sarah. Listen, Todd. You rest now, but I'm picking you up at 6.30 p.m. for dinner. I want to treat you to the best food you've ever had in London. Where will it be? You'll see. Just rest, dress comfortably, and I'll pick you up later. I picked Todd up right on time. I felt like a child with a new toy as I directed the taxi driver to our apartment. I was so excited that I would be able to introduce someone from the house to Fiona. So if I knew you were cooking dinner, I would have insisted that I pay. I can only imagine what kind of cook you are. Oh, unbeliever. I objected. Fiona is a great cook, and she's been stressing about dinner all day. You won't be disappointed, trust me. As soon as I showed Todd into the apartment, Fiona joined us, her apron barely covering her obvious pregnant belly. 
Todd Brooks, let me introduce you to the most beautiful cook in the world and soon to be mother of my baby, Fiona Kelly. Todd stared at Fiona for a moment in obvious surprise before hugging her warmly. Since you haven't married this guy yet, I demand the opportunity to share a few stories with you in private. There's still time to talk some sense into you. Oh, I think I can answer you with a story for a story. The truth is that I am quite partial to this mischievous scoundrel, despite what you can tell me. I think I will still keep him, she stroked her pregnant belly, or should I say, will keep him. Little Ian will need his father. You still think it won't be Brianna? I joked. No way. If you had to carry him inside you, you'd know the truth too. This baby is definitely going to be Ian Peter Miller. Changing the subject, I said to Fiona, Todd is here to discuss a project together, but since he's a longtime friend, he wants to update me on the status of my divorce. Not until after dinner, Finn ordered. It's ready to serve. Todd admitted that I did tell the truth about Fiona's cooking skills. After a wonderful scotch broth and mixed green salad, Finn served the lamb ribs with roasted new potatoes and green beans. When she asked if we wanted dessert, both Todd and I groaned but gratefully accepted a slice of a wonderful fro cake. Peter, my friend, Todd began, moving away from the table, if you eat like this, I'm surprised you both aren't more at home. Well, I started winking at Finn as she started clearing the table. Hey, buddy, I know how Fiona got to look like that, and it has nothing to do with what she ate. When Finn came back for more dishes, I pulled her into my lap. She gave me a gentle kiss on the cheek and tried to get up. I held her. I'll clean it up later, love. Just rest. See what I have to put up with, she joked, letting Todd know. Yes, I joked in response, it's a hard life, isn't it? I placed my hand on Fiona's knee and gently stroked her lower thigh. As I did this, Fiona relaxed and leaned back into my arms. I was a happy man, and I knew Todd saw it. So, tell me, Todd, what can you tell me about my poor ex-wife? Todd hesitated for a long time before answering. Finally, in a low voice, he said, I have nothing to say, Peter. Sarah is suffering a lot. She and Ann have become very close, they talk almost every day. So, I can tell you that she is really suffering, very much. There have been a lot of mistakes in this whole situation. It was terribly managed. She understands that. What does that mean now, though? He simply shook his head. Did you ever find out who the other guy was? I asked, not sure I really wanted to know the answer. Todd shook his head vigorously. I can't say. This is for Sarah to tell. Sorry. It's probably for the best, I admitted. So what can I do to convince her to sign the papers? I don't know, man. I really don't know. Talk to her. Talk to Sarah, man. You need to talk to each other. There was sadness in Todd's voice. I suspected that and wasn't the only one who had become good friends with Sarah. It really made me feel better. She may have treated me badly, but deep down, she was a good person. She deserved support. Maybe she can learn a few lessons about what went wrong in her marriage so she doesn't make the same mistakes next time. After the short conversation about Sarah, Todd apologized for the rest of the evening. He said he was tired after the flight and needed rest. I arranged to meet him at the ITI Financial Building on Monday afternoon. Then I called him a taxi, and he left. I was hoping that I could learn a little more from Todd about what was going on with Sarah. The way he spoke, I assumed he had quite an interesting story. Just shows what happens when you make assumptions. Well, at least Finn and I turned out no worse than we were before. It was a pleasure working with Todd again. He was the only part of going to ITI that I regretted. It was good to know that I had a longtime friend working at the same place, someone I could go out with after work, have a couple of beers, and talk sports with. His visit ended too quickly. Just after Wednesday morning, Finn and I drove Todd to Heathrow Airport and flew him back to the States. Todd's plane had barely taken off when my cell phone rang. It was my lawyer. Sarah finally signed the divorce papers. With luck, everything will be formalized and signed within a few days. Then, in a month, I will be a free man. Fiona heard the excitement in my voice and realized what was happening. 
she was just as excited as I was, even though she hadn't been officially told anything yet. As soon as I finished the call, I turned to her, got down on my knees, and asked, Fiona Kelly, would you be so kind as to marry me? I was thinking about late October if you can fit it into your calendar. Hmm, she began, you know. She thought as she rubbed her pregnant belly. I'll talk to Ian Peter for a bit, and we'll get back to you. That's normal, I countered. You two make a decision. I'll just wait here until you decide. With a giggle, Finn took my hand and pulled me to my feet. Then she literally jumped into my arms. How I managed to catch such an awkward bun, I have no idea. I don't think the kid was nearly as excited about this maneuver as his mom or dad. After she showered me with kisses, Fiona said, we both say yes. For the rest of the week, Fiona and her mother were constantly on the phone. It was decided that the wedding would take place near her parents' home in Bristol. Since I had very few relatives who could come, my parents died a few years ago in a car accident in the winter, my closest relative is an aging uncle and his wife. I invited them, but I doubted that they would make the trip, even at my expense. A week later, my lawyer informed me that the divorce would be finalized on Friday, October 24th. Finn immediately made arrangements with a small Methodist church on the outskirts of Bristol to hold the wedding on October 25th. With a wedding to plan and another five months of pregnancy, Finn asked her employer for maternity leave. He happily agreed. Me too, until I realized it meant she was moving back to Bristol. I didn't like it, but it was only for a month. I became very familiar with the M4 route and found that I could cover the distance in about two hours. Of course, I had serious motivation for a good time on the road. Fiona was absolutely wonderful. Her hair was styled in a modified bob and sparkled red. She was a little over six months pregnant but still decided to wear a white dress. I couldn't be prouder of her or more in love with her. The day was magical, just like our wedding night. Due to pregnancy, we decided not to go on our honeymoon right away but to plan something for the summer. I was thinking about a week on the Spanish Riviera, but Finn didn't say anything. Our wedding night took place at the St. David's Hotel in Cardiff. Although we returned to London the next day, I took a few days off to simply enjoy time with my new wife. It was the beginning of the happiest time of my life. Unfortunately, work was waiting for me at the end of this, and whether I liked it or not, I needed to get back to it. Fiona resumed her duties in her new position at ITI head office on the other side of town. At 4.47 a.m. on March 20th, our family grew larger. Our healthy baby boy was born with a powerful cry. 10 fingers, 10 toes, a strong pair of lungs, good appetite judging by the diligence with which he began his first feeding, and a fluffy head of red hair. One look at him, however, and it was clear that he was my son. What are you going to name him? The nurse asked, handing our son to his mother. Ian P., I began to answer. Finn waved me off and said, our son will be named Peter Ian Miller. I turned to Finn in shock. This baby needs to be named after his father, I whispered, offering her breast to our son. I still want to honor my grandfather, but he should also be named after his dad. If I thought the previous three months had been bliss, life now approached paradise itself. Suddenly, I began to regret my time in ITI. If given the opportunity, I would happily take time off and become a full-time father. Even having to change some very dirty diapers didn't dampen my enthusiasm for caring for my son. My son, how wonderful this sounds. I didn't even love Finn as much as I loved my son. Luckily, Fiona understood my feelings. She also completely separated them. The child has become the center of our life, the point of all our activities, the focus of our existence. Life for the Miller family was going well. Peter Ian grew by leaps and bounds. When he was nine months old, he was already trying to sit up. Soon after, he struggled to stand on two legs. Of course, he couldn't walk, but try telling him that. It won't be easy with Peter Ian, he knew exactly what he wanted and was not going to accept rejection. A year after Peter Ian was born, Fiona became pregnant again. Three of us in the apartment were cramped, but four of us would probably require moving, although there was no rush. We kept our eyes open, planning for the day next fall when moving would become mandatory. Finn's second pregnancy was much more difficult than her first. At my insistence, she took sick leave from work. 
I took more time to help around the house. When I was at home, I took full charge of Peter Ian's care. Then, at the end of February, my life came crashing down around me. I didn't know it then, but my world of bliss was over. It was a Friday afternoon, and I was at work, trying to finalize the details of the proposal before the weekend. I've been careful not to take home any more work than is absolutely necessary, and with Finn's delicate condition, this has become even more important to me. I instinctively grabbed the phone when it rang, waiting for new information for the offer. It was a hospital. Finn was hospitalized. By the time I got to the hospital, Finn had lost the baby. It was a crushing blow for her. I tried to comfort her and reassure her that I still loved her, but nothing I said seemed to help. However, I knew that words might not help, but my presence would. I pulled her close and just held her. She was lethargic and did not respond to everything I did. After a few days of rest, Fiona returned to work with an enthusiasm I had never seen from her before. She literally threw herself into her work. At the same time, I felt her slowly moving away from me emotionally. When I tried to talk to her about it, she initially denied it and later started tearing my head off in an angry argument. Over the next few months, she moved closer and further away from me like the tide. Each time she moved further away from me, what hurt the most was that she had also become distant from Peter Ian. Peter Ian noticed that his mother was missing. Over the summer, I tried to get her to go to counseling. I assured her that I would join her if necessary. Each time the conversation ended in a big quarrel, each worse than the previous one. I was beside myself with worry. Then, at the end of August, the bank holiday gave us a long weekend. I tried to persuade Fiona to leave with me. Her parents would happily take Peter Ian to us. Fiona categorically refused. Instead, she asked me to look after the baby while she went to Bristol without me. She assured me that she needed this time away from home to recover. When I come back, everything will be, you'll see. What was I supposed to say? If it helped her, I was all for it. I agreed and looked forward to a long weekend with my son. Fiona took the Friday off before the long weekend, and so on Thursday evening after dinner, she headed to Bristol. For Peter Ian and me, Friday went pretty much as usual. I took him to the nanny and went to work. Since Finn took our car, I had to hire a taxi. I happened to meet Evan McAdams at lunch. I explained to him our bachelor weekend and asked what he would advise me to do with my son. He suggested a zoo. It sounded like just the thing for a curious 20-month-old boy, but transportation was an issue. Evan solved this problem by offering to use one of his cars. I gladly accepted the offer and picked him up on my way home from work. That evening, I had a wonderful day with my son. On Saturday, like any little boy, the larger the animal, the more fascinated he was. He was especially fascinated by the big cat exhibition. As a big child, I was fascinated by the kangaroo and emu exhibit at the Australian Pavilion. But try as I might, I could not interest Peter Ian. He dragged me to the Komodo dragon instead. By the end of the day, both Finn's boys were exhausted. Although tired, Peter Ian was in seventh heaven. I kept dinner simple and then calmed him down by reading a long story from one of his favorite books. I decided that on Sunday, we would just relax all day. Evan and Paula invited us to dinner that evening, and since I needed to return the car, dinner with the McAdams seemed like a relaxed way to spend the holiday. It was better than spending the whole day alone. I never made it to dinner. At 3.05 p.m. this Sunday, I received a call from the hospital in Brighton. Your wife and her friend were in a very serious accident, I was told. I was told where to find her, but little else. I called Paula McAdams and explained the emergency. She offered to take Peter Ian while Evan came with me to Brighton. But why did she have to be in Brighton? Peter asked as we drove out of the city on the M23. I don't know, Evan. She should have been with her parents. Have you called them yet? Crap, I cursed pulling out my mobile phone. Peter, what a surprise, my father-in-law answered when he heard my voice. How is my grandson? And when will you and his mother bring the guy to visit? This didn't sound like the answer of a man who spent the weekend with his daughter, Andy, I began cautiously. Did Fiona visit you this weekend? After a long pause came the answer, no, he said in a low voice. 
She had to. It's a long story, and I don't know all the details yet. I just wanted you to know that she and her friend are in the hospital in Brighton. I told him all the information that the hospital employee gave me. What was she doing in Brighton, Peter? And who was that friend she was with? I held back a tear. I don't know, Andy. I just don't know. We'll be there as soon as possible, Peter. Before talking to Father Finn, I had successfully avoided even thinking about it. What was Finn doing in Brighton, and who was she there with? I felt an empty feeling in my stomach, which was quickly filled with a crowd of butterflies. Who was she with, Evan? Do you have any ideas? No, Peter. I haven't, but I have concerns. Evan's silence after that comment was heartbreaking. Talk to me, Evan. You're killing me here. There were rumors of an in-office affair between Fiona and another man, but that was before you came on the scene. There has been absolutely nothing since then. Plus, he now works in a different department from Fiona. They don't have a chance to be together. I sobbed, wiping the moisture from my eyes. Most likely, it was one of her friends. Evan drove me as close to the door as possible and then went to park the car. I literally ran through the hospital until I found the ICU. I was greeted by a team of nurses and technicians who showed me to the consulting room. A few minutes later, both Evan and the doctor arrived. Mr. Miller, thank you for coming so quickly. I won't take up much time, but I wanted to let you know how serious your wife's condition is. Things are on edge at the moment, we'll know more in the next 24 hours. What happened to her, doctor? He brushed off my question. I know you have a lot of questions, and there will be time for all of them later. Right now, you need to worry about Mrs. Miller's condition. She is in critical condition. The car was traveling at a very high speed and flipped over several times. Mrs. Miller has many fractures, three broken ribs, and a punctured lung. Several internal organs are damaged, but our main concern is her head. She suffered a very serious head injury. I screamed in shock. Will she survive? The doctor winced. I can't say for sure. As I said, everything is on the edge. Her friend Mr. Wilkinson did not survive. He died instantly. Ken Wilkinson? Evan screamed. The doctor nodded. Ken Wilkinson. Now I have a name. He was the head of accounting at ITI Financial, Fiona's former boss, married with three children. He's like the salt of the earth, or so I thought. When can I see Finn? I intervened. Now, if you want. Just don't bother her more than absolutely necessary. With fear and trembling, I allowed the nurse to escort me to Fiona's room. Even with all the doctor's preparations, I was not prepared for what I saw. Finn seemed buried in a sea of tubes, her head was wrapped in a bandage, and it was obvious that her hair had been shaved off on one side. Worst of all, she was completely motionless, the only sound in the room was the slow and regular hum of the machines. I whispered words of love to her, but I wasn't sure I believed them at that moment. If my suspicions were correct, then Finn and I had a long way to go before I could say I loved her again. I wasn't even sure I wanted to take that journey, but for Peter and Ian's sake, I might have to try. Fiona still didn't move. I gently stroked her cheek but felt no response. Oh God, Finn, I whispered to myself, hoping she didn't hear me. What have you done? A few minutes later, the nurse came in with a chair for me. I will not disturb you, I asked. Just don't bother her any more than absolutely necessary. She was about to leave but then walked towards the closet. Oh, her purse was left here when she arrived, and here are the other things she was wearing when she arrived. Her clothes, of course, couldn't be saved. I was holding a small bag containing the necklace I gave Finn for her last birthday. There were also earrings from the set, but no wedding ring or diamond engagement ring. When I asked, the nurse said she didn't wear them. I hesitated to look through Finn's purse, fearing what I might find, but in the end, I had to. In the outer pocket was an envelope containing a key card for a local hotel. Later, I found her engagement ring and diamond ring hidden in the pocket of her suitcase. She and Ken met at a motel near the waterfront. I sat looking at the motionless figure of my wife, wondering how we got to this point. Now I have become a victim of two cheating wives. 
What is it about me that provokes this behavior in those who claim to love me? Peter, a voice from the door brought me out of my gloomy thoughts. Evan sent us. How is she? Not very good. I forced a smile at my wife's parents. Any idea what happened? I just shook my head. Why don't you spend some time alone with your daughter? With a slow feeling of rejection, I headed to the waiting room. I found Evan just as he was putting down the phone. He squeezed my shoulder comfortingly. What a mess, he whispered. How is she? I shook my head. I couldn't even put it into words. Only time will tell. This was as close as I could get to expressing what I was afraid of. I was just talking to someone in accounting who always knows the latest gossip, Evan suggested. I don't know if it's any consolation, but I doubt it lasted long. In fact, it might have been a one-time occurrence for them. It didn't help at all. I wanted my wife back, my Finn, not that stupid woman on the bed. The place in my stomach filled with butterflies came alive again, and Evan led me to a comfortable chair in the waiting room. Finn didn't survive the night. It was shortly after midnight when I was awakened from a restless sleep. Her injuries were too severe. I became a widower, and my son lost his mother. What a pile of crap life has become. September 5th joined the growing list of significant days during my stay in Britain. On this day, I buried my wife, the mother of my son. It was the most difficult day of my life. It was much worse than anything Sarah left behind. We have shared very few real details behind the accident. We left it as Fiona was on holiday and died in a tragic accident. No one seemed to connect her death with Ken Wilkinson. If they did, they didn't say anything. I lost interest in my work. I simply mechanically carried out my duties. The only focus of my life was Peter Ian, and I clung to him as best I could. Now, I need advice. Luckily, I took my own advice and made weekly appointments. Evan and Paula did everything they could to bring me out of my shell. They had only minor success. Peter Ian enjoyed their efforts, however. Andy and Beth Kelly disappeared from my world. They tried to contact their grandson, but I suspected that they blamed me for Fiona's death. Deep down, I believed they were right. In the end, I coped with two wives. There had to be something wrong with me. Since the Kellys had to contact me to see Peter Ian, they left him alone. It hurt me for my son. I continued to work at ITI Financial, but my heart was not in it. Because of my son, I couldn't and didn't want to work late, but I regularly brought things home to work on after Peter Ian had gone to bed. I settled into a comfortable, if somewhat hectic, routine. I missed Finn terribly. October 25th passed by. I took a few days off and took Peter Ian on a trip to Scotland. The thought of being alone in the apartment on what would have been our second wedding anniversary was too painful. Regardless of what Finn did at the end of our marriage, we enjoyed some wonderful times. I really missed those moments. As November came to an end, I realized that the holidays were approaching and I would only have my son for family. The prospect was not encouraging. After all, Peter Ian's second birthday wouldn't come until a month after Christmas. Evan insisted that I join his family for the holidays. I refused. It sounded nice, but I knew I would feel left out. I preferred to be alone than to be an object of pity. Imagine my surprise when on Saturday, November 21st, I answered the door and saw Sarah. Can I come in and talk, Peter? She asked, somewhat embarrassed. Sarah looked absolutely stunning. Her hair was longer and well-styled. She had lost quite a lot of weight and looked slim and toned. The Christmas red dress she wore hugged her figure and made her look absolutely gorgeous. Well, they say time heals all wounds and since I was feeling pretty wounded, I saw no reason to refuse her, of course. Glad to see a friendly face, I turned the leader into the living room. Peter Ian had cars and trucks scattered all over the floor, making walking difficult. As I turned to talk to Sarah, I noticed a small face peeking out from behind her skirt. She looked like her mother, although she seemed a little older than Peter Ian. The surprise on my face should have been obvious. With a smile, Sarah said, don't be shy, honey. He won't bite you. Then the little girl saw Peter Ian on the floor playing and ran to join him. They immediately plunged into a parallel game. Her name is Rachel Lynn Miller, Sarah said. She was born on October 27th, two days after our divorce. 
she bears my mother's full name. I was touched. Sarah barely got to know my mother before she died. Mom would be delighted with her granddaughter and would spoil her beyond belief. Oh my God, suddenly a lot became clear. Now I understood the delay in the divorce, as well as the sudden change after Todd's visit. I also suspected that Sarah's pregnancy was behind her short patience on the day of the argument. Rachel, my daughter. Her hair was blonde, but like her mother's, it would probably darken with age. Her eyes were green, like mine. I watched Rachel and Peter Ian play, amazed by what I saw. Rachel had enough Miller traits to make me not doubt her origins. When I found out Rachel was coming, I was overjoyed. I couldn't wait to tell you. Sarah paused. She's yours, you know. Please don't doubt it. Although if you want to do a test, I'll understand. No, everything is okay. I was almost speechless with surprise. I was so hoping that you would come to me or at least call me. I wanted to explain everything to you so much. I never stopped loving you, you know. Sarah held back a tear, but then Todd called me while he was at your place, and oh God, Sarah, I'm so sorry. I was a real jerk. I cried as I realized how quickly I had jumped to the wrong conclusions and the stories were a terrible mistake while you were away. I had some free time, and I decided to write some fantasies. I wanted to create stories about the romance I knew I had to live with you. I don't know why I never published them. I guess I never believed that anyone I knew would find them. It was so stupid, Sarah. I'm so sorry. I was a fool to think you could cheat on me. I messed it up so bad. It was my fault, too, Peter. I've regretted every day for the last two and a half years how irrationally I responded to your fears. When I realized what it looked like from your point of view, I couldn't blame you. I just wanted to talk, but by then you had already moved on. The irony of it all is that I got what I deserved. Fiona actually did what I accused you of. I guess I deserved it for the way I treated you. No, there was determination in her voice, Peter. No one ever deserves this. So, what brings you to London? I asked, praying to change the subject. You fool. I wanted you to meet your daughter. And if you don't come to me, I decided that I'd better come to you, Sarah forced herself to smile. Besides, I thought you might need a shoulder to cry on. How long can you stay? I have an open return ticket, but I wasn't planning on coming home until after Christmas, unless you wanted us to leave earlier. Where are you both staying? Todd found a place for us. One of his friends offered us a place to stay. I nodded automatically, not wanting to go deeper. You might know them, Evan and Paula Adams. Now I was really surprised. This is definitely not what I expected to hear. No wonder Evan and Paula were so insistent that I spend Christmas with them. Todd called Evan a little later, well after your wife's funeral. Evan told Todd he could tell me about your loss. Todd asked if he could tell me about your loss. Evan obviously thought you needed a lift in spirits because he called me directly to invite me to come. I took a leave from work, and here I am. I sat back and watched the two toddlers play contentedly on the floor, a boy without a mother and a girl who did not know her father. They were separated for only six months, both were mine. What should I do about it now? Is there hope for us, Peter, Sarah? We've both been hurt badly. It's too early to think about us. I'm not even sure I'm ready to think about me yet. I understand, Peter. It took me a long time to get to where I am now. I'm willing to wait. In the meantime, Rachel needs to get to know her dad as well as her brother. We arranged to meet for lunch on Sunday, and despite the terrible weather, we had a good time. Sarah and I maintained a friendly, if guarded, distance. She spent a lot of time with Peter, and I spent a lot of time with Rachel. Both children spent a lot of time interacting with each other. They were still at the stage of shyness and uncertainty, but they got along great. Sarah, I began as I pulled up to the McAdams house to drop them off. How about I take Thursday off? I could cook dinner for the four of us. Interesting, of course, but what's so special about Thursday? I've been in London for almost three years and haven't forgotten, but you've only been here a few days and don't know. It's Thursday, Sarah looked at me in confusion. At home, it would be Turkey, Macy's Parade, 
and football. She sighed. How could I forget Thanksgiving? But it's not a holiday here, so what? We both laughed. It was the first time we shared a laugh in years. Does that mean you'll come? I wouldn't miss this. I got up early on Thursday and went to the market. I wanted to make dinner as special as possible, so on the way home, I stopped at the bakery and bought that pie that I knew was Sarah's favorite, as well as a nice loaf of bread. Sarah and Rachel were due to attend a formal dinner at 2 p.m. Everything was ready for their arrival. Smells great, Peter. I didn't know you could cook. This is a side of you I've never seen before. Necessity is the mother of invention, they say. Fiona and I were busy at work, we shared cooking duties. The formal dining room, which Fiona had decorated so beautifully, was elegantly laid out. Candles stood in the middle of the table on either side of a beautiful flower arrangement. Sarah noticed they weren't lit and laughed. With two kids, there's no point in tempting fate, I countered. The dinner was a little unconventional, but I knew my son. He wouldn't go for turkey or anything that ever had feathers. Spaghetti with meatballs was his best dish. As it turns out, Rachel liked my homemade sauce too. For Sarah and me, there was a bird, although somewhat smaller than a roast turkey, two quail, stuffing, roasted potatoes, and fresh asparagus, accompanied by a bottle of wine that I knew Sarah would enjoy. The two kids happily pounced on the spaghetti. Luckily, I prepared by turning two plastic trash bags into poncho bibs. This turned out to be a great idea. Besides, Sarah really enjoyed it. After dinner, I put on an Aladdin DVD, and my two kids fell asleep watching the Disney classic together. They've never looked cuter. Sarah and I spoke, sharing the pain we both experienced from our thoughtless spouses. It was like a bolt from the blue, but at the same time, it was cathartic to finally share all the pain and suffering I had stored up inside. The day ended too quickly. Over the next few weeks, Sarah and I spent a lot of time together. At first, most of it was with the children. After a few family dates, Paula McAdams offered to take the kids. Sarah and I spent several very pleasant evenings together. She particularly enjoyed the trip to the Royal Festival Hall, where the London Philharmonic Orchestra presented a magnificent concert entirely dedicated to Beethoven. We planned to spend Christmas with Evan and Paula McAdams. They insisted on it. I wasn't really looking forward to it, not because I didn't cherish the holidays anymore, but rather, I looked forward to them bitterly. I still miss the Fiona I once knew and loved before her miscarriage sent her into depression. Sarah's presence and our newfound communication were wonderful. The thing I didn't like about the holidays was the realization that Sarah and Rachel would soon be returning to the States. I didn't like it at all. Buying gifts for the children was easy, but choosing something for Sarah took a lot more thought. Finally, the perfect gift came to me, literally. It arrived on Monday, December 21st, shortly after I arrived at the office. Mr. Miller, you have a call from Daniel Price on line one, my secretary announced. This was not so different from the dozens of other similar advertisements I received during my three years at ITI Financial. Daniel and I communicated regularly, although I could not understand what prompted him to make this call. Nothing new happened between ITI and Parker Price, Daniel. To what do I owe the honor of this call? Merry Christmas, by the way. I have a favor to ask of you, Peter. This is a problem I've been scratching my head over for weeks, and I think only you can solve it. I'll try. What happened? It's a personnel matter. Helen wants me to retire, and I've finally agreed. I think she'll regret it though. We've decided to reach an agreement, I'll reduce my responsibilities and retain my position as chairman and CEO, though it would be nominal. I'll hire a new COO and president who will handle all the usual responsibilities of a CEO to manage operations. The problem is finding the right person. Todd Brooks came to mind. I adore Todd, but he spent his career in sales. He doesn't have much management experience. If you want to go that route, he would be a good choice but you may have to do more than be a figurehead CEO. That's exactly what I thought. Then I thought about Maria Santoro. Maria will be the best in the business one day. I haven't seen her work in three years, but at that point, she was a rising star. She would be a great number two on the team, 
but I'm not sure she's really ready to be COO yet. I completely agree with you. This brings me to my final choice. He's the best in the business, but he's not part of the Parker Price team. Coming from outside wouldn't be a bad thing. It might bring a new perspective on things. Peter, we are so similar in this way. There was a long pause in the conversation. So, will you take the job? I. I. I don't know why this came as a surprise to me, but it did. I need to think about it. I need to discuss it with Evan too. When do you need to know? The next board meeting will be on January 15th. I hope to nominate my deputy as COO by then. I couldn't concentrate on work that day. Instead, I picked up a notepad and started taking notes. At the top of the page, I listed the positive aspects of moving, below the negatives. I didn't like the idea of taking Peter Ian away from his grandparents, but they hadn't been particularly friendly to me since Fiona's death. I knew they absolutely loved Peter Ian, but he and I were a package deal. On the other hand, there was Sarah. But was I ready to do it again? It would have been a huge step forward in my career, but I loved it in London. By mid-afternoon, I took a lunch break and went for a walk to sort out my thoughts. I met Evan in the hallway just after I got back to the office. Can I talk to you, Evan? Of course. Here, or do you want to go out for a pint? Even though I had just had lunch, I chose the second option. After we each had a pint of Guinness, I shared my dilemma with Evan. I knew I couldn't keep you as my second in command forever, since I'm not yet ready to retire myself. This poses a problem. I was hoping your wife would keep you here, but his voice trailed off in sadness, which we both felt. What do you want to do? I want to stay here at ITI Financial. Oh, okay. But what about Sarah? I know. I'm starting to think we'll end up trying to start over. Did you tell her about this? We dropped hints, but she says she'll wait for me. That's what I was hoping to hear. I like Sarah. You both messed up last time, but after all the pain you both went through, I think you might make it work this time. Maybe Sarah and I should talk tonight. Maybe after our wedding, we could live here. That would be great. But what about Sarah's job, her career? She might have a hard time finding the same kind of work here in London. The economy isn't doing well, plus she's put a lot into her job in the States. I nodded absently. It doesn't help, Peter. I appreciate your loyalty to ITI, but there comes a time when a bird needs to learn to fly. I stole you from Daniel Price, now it's time for me to return you to him. I made a promise to him, after all. I looked at Evan with confusion. Daniel Price talked to you about this? Evan shook his head. Not recently. We spoke before you took the job at ITI. He told me that his retirement would be in three or four years. He also said that he wants you back. I was hoping for four years, but apparently, I will have to come to terms with three. What if I don't want to come back? I still have many years before I want to think about retirement, so there won't be a place for you to move to at ITI Financial. Besides, a deal is a deal. I'm afraid I'd have to fire you. Well, apparently, everything is decided. I thanked Evan for his help and left to finish my Christmas shopping. I found the perfect solution at a jewelry store, a beautiful engagement ring with three diamonds. I wrapped it in Christmas wrap. Later, I placed this box in another box and wrapped it again in Christmas wrapping. Finally, I placed this box in a shoebox and wrapped it in shiny gold paper with a red ribbon and bow. After Christmas Eve dinner, we all exchanged gifts. I gave Evan a very expensive bottle of scotch whiskey. For Paula, I bought a book that I knew she wanted, along with a gift card to her favorite store. Sarah's gift was the last one to be given out. She made fun of me as she kept finding more boxes to open. But when the last one was in front of her, I got down on one knee. As she opened the small box, I said, Sarah, will you marry me again? I promise not to be such a jerk this time. We spent a full month of our honeymoon in London, staying in my apartment. It was actually a working holiday, as I needed to free her up to move back to the States. I would like to say that we lived happily ever after. For the most part, this was true. There were difficult times when we readjusted to each other's habits and preferences. 
Our two children learn to fight, just like all other siblings. They also learn to take care of their little sister, who arrived exactly one year after we returned home. Happy forever? We're not sure yet, but we're working on it as hard as we can. What do you think of our story today? It seems to me that the wife is completely wrong because she had everything, marital happiness, well-being, a wonderful husband, but she chose to cheat on him rather than live happily ever after with him. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. Until new videos.